Merry Christmas, or should I say Christmas, because that is what we are celebrating. We are celebrating the birth of Christ. And I don't know about you, but it is hard to really kind of think about and imagine that we are already at the end of another year. And not only with the end of a year, but we're at the end of a decade. I mean, we're about to go into 2020. It is crazy. And, and I heard somebody say not too long ago that the days are long, but the years are short. And I think that's such a great phrase because here we are at the end of 2019 again. We're already at Christmas, a few days away. But we want to make sure that, as always, we stop and we celebrate. Because 2019 has been an incredible year in the life of our church, and I don't know what it's been like in your life, but I pray that it has been merry, and if not, I hope you at least have a merry Christmas. But we've had some incredible things happen in the life of our church. One of them happened last weekend, and I just want to highlight it before we jump into the message for today. But last weekend, if you were here, we had our Multiply Giving Day, where we challenged everybody in our church, both locations, to give to our vision to multiply. And I am so happy to announce to you that we had the largest one-day giving ever in the history of our church. And so I just want to give God glory and credit for that. Man, come on. It's uh, just an amazing, an amazing thing. I mean, you guys just blew us away by your generosity. And because of your generosity, we are able to now finish out our Jasper campus well. And that when we move into our permanent location there uh, at the first of the year. Don't know exactly that date, but we'll talk more about that when we get closer to it. And then also plant more churches around the world, literally uh, going uh, to Kenya in February again to look at that. And, and we'll have more news, exciting news to share about that as well as we move forward. And then other churches that we'll be planting and other things that God is going to lead us to do in 2020. And so because of your generosity, we are set up in a great position financially to continue to be able to multiply as a church. And so I just wanted to say thank you so much for that. Now, if you've got a Bible, open it up to Matthew chapter one. All right, Matthew chapter one. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry about it. We're going to have the verses here on the screen. But Matthew chapter uh, or Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. All right. So it comes right after Malachi or depending upon how Italian you are, Malachi. All right. And so it is the first book in the New Testament. And it's significant, not only that it's the first book, but we're going to look at the first chapter in Matthew. All right. So Matthew chapter one. But I'm going to warn you before, not really warn you, but just tell you before we get into it. The first 17 verses are a genealogy. And, and most often, if you were anything like me, like when you came to this in your Bible reading plan, if you had one, you just a list of names, you would skip them. And I get it because reading a list of names in a genealogy is like reading names out of a phone book. And for those of you under 20, we used to have these things called a phone book. All right. And if you don't know what a phone book is, there used to be back in the day, long before internet, long before cell phones, we had these things called landline phones. And depending upon, again, how old school you are, we used to have things called party lines. Anybody know what a party line was? That was when you and your neighbors all shared the same phone. And so if your neighbor was on the phone with her girlfriend, you just forget it, all right? You ain't using the phone. And, and then it turned into individual lines. And back then, this is what's crazy, and I was telling my kids this the other day, we didn't even have call waiting. So if you call somebody and they were just talking it up, you got a busy signal. You just might as well get in your car and drive over to their house, right? Because no call waiting, nor did we have caller ID. I remember when we got caller ID as this little contraption that then I knew who it was calling so I could decide whether or not we wanted to answer it. That was like getting saved, man. I mean, it was just incredible. And so we've come a long way, but a phone book was literally a list of names of everybody's names and their numbers in case you wanted to call them. And so when we're reading a list of genealogies like this, a lot of times like, man, we're just reading a list of names. But I want you to understand that not only is it significant because it's in the Bible and we should read it, but there is theological significance to those names. And so you're going to have to hang with me because I'm going to read a bunch of names and I'm going to do my best to get them correct. All right. Because they are, uh, some of them are hard to say. So give me some grace on that. But then I want to show you why they are there. All right. But as always, before we jump into the text, let's pray and ask God to bless our time together, all right? Pray with me. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you so much for who you are. And not only your word, God, that we have today to study, but the fact that Christmas is the celebration of the word becoming flesh. You incarnating into our world. You putting on flesh to be like us, to save us. And God, as we open up your word today, I pray that you would show us that truth. You would help me. 
by your Holy Spirit to communicate this truth, and then you would help all of us to hear it. Give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see the truth that is in your word. And God, I pray if there's anybody here that doesn't know you, that you would save them. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter one, all right? And so here's the setup, verse one. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So this is his lineage. Now you need to understand, and I've said this before, Jesus Christ, Christ is his title. That's not his name. It wasn't his middle name. That wasn't his last name. His name is Jesus. Christ is his title. It means anointed one or Messiah. So this is the lineage or the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac, the father of Jacob and Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. We doing all right so far? You probably know a lot of those names. You've been around church. Now let's get into the thick of it. Verse three, and Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, the father by Tamar and Perez, the father of Hezron and Hezron, the father of Ram and Ram, the father of Aminadab and Aminadab, the father of nation and nation, the father of Salmon or Salmon, Salmon, depending on how redneck you are. All right. They would say Salmon, all right, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, although they wouldn't say the J sound, would be Yesi, and Yesi, the father of David the king. So, so far, Matthew has traced it from Abraham to David. Now, those two names are very, very significant. Abraham is the one who, in Genesis 12, God calls And he says, go to a land that I will show you because out of you, I'm going to make you a great nation. And then he does make them into a nation from his son, Isaac, and then goes to Jacob. And then he changes his name to Israel. And then it's the nation of Israel. He's got 12 sons and of which David becomes the second king. And David is the most prominent king in the line of Israel, in the history of Israel. And so, so far, Matthew's just showing you that connection. Now he goes on, look at verse six. He says, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah and Solomon, the father of Rehoboam and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah and Abijah, the father of Asaph and Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, Joram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Let's take a deep breath there. All right. So now we got from David, King David to King Hezekiah. And all those kings in between. Verse 10. And Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amos, Amos, the father of Josiah, Josiah, the father of Je- uh, Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. So you go from Abraham to David, and then David until the exile, which we know from history that happened in 586 BC. And what happened was when David came in, conquered Jerusalem, made that where the temple was or was going to be, Solomon built the temple, the very first temple, and they worshiped there. It was the center of their worship, but because of their sin, because of their worshiping other gods, God exiles them. But the Babylonians come in, destroy the temple, and now they're in exile. So that's the second group of lineage of Jesus. Now here's the third one. Verse 12. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel the father of Abud, Abud the father of Eliakim, Eliakim the father of Azor, Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Akim, Akim the father of Eliud, Eliud the father of Eleazar, Eleazar the father of Mathen, Mathen the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, finally some names I recognize, of whom Jesus was born who is called Christ. So Matthew is showing you the lineage of Jesus, and he does it in three groups. So the group from Abraham to David, from David to exile, and then from exile to Jesus. In verse 17, there's significance, Matthew tells us. Look at this. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. From David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. Now let's talk about why this list is important. A couple things. One that Matthew is highlighting, he is writing primarily to the Jewish people and he is showing them that Jesus is in the line of Abraham and in the line of David. Those two names, very significant. Again, one, 
the nation of Israel came out of Abraham. Literally, God said, I'm gonna give you a son and that son will turn into a great nation which will bless all nations. And so that's significant. And then it has to come through David because God had promised David that the Messiah or the king would never leave his throne uh, from his line. And so that's significant as well. So significant that Matthew divides the sections by the number of David. Now, you may have looked at that or heard, like, why does it matter that it's 14 generations? It was one group of 14, another group of 14, a third group of 14. A couple things I think why that matters. One is 14 is the number of David. It is David's number. In the Bible, numbers have significance. If you're looking for a fun time over Christmas break, maybe to get away from your family, just Google Gematria, and you will learn that it's a system where the Hebrew language, the letters, have numbers corresponding to it, and so therefore those numbers have significance. And so there are numbers in the Bible that have huge significance to the Hebrew people. Seven is one. That's the days of creation. Ten, because of Ten Commandments. Twelve, because of the tribes of Israel. Forty, because of all the, uh, the flood and all those kinds of things. Another number was 14. That is because that's the number of David. Well, how is it the number of David? Well, the name David, they would say David, didn't have, when you would write it out, I think I've said this before, Hebrew didn't have vowels, it just had confident, con- consonants. And they would literally, I just think this is kind of funny, they would have literally spelt his name DVD. And so D is the fourth letter, so you got the number four. V is the sixth letter, you got the number six. So four plus six is 10. You guys are smart. All right, guys, you pay attention to school. And then D repeats again, and it is four. So 10 plus four is what? 14. 14. So when you see the number 14, Matthew is saying something to us, that that number is significant. And the reason why it's significant is because he is tracing the lineage of Jesus through his royal line to Joseph. So Joseph was in the line of David, which obviously was in the line of Abraham. And that's significant because that's what the prophecy said the Messiah had to meet, had to be. And that is because Matthew's whole point is Jesus is in the royal line. He is a king. This is why his list is different than Luke. If you've ever read the story in Luke or the gospel of Luke, Luke's account is primarily in Luke chapter chapter 3 is from Mary's lineage. Most scholars believe that he's tracing Mary's lineage, and there's some differences between Matthew's list. One of the biggest differences is he says David's son was Nathan, which Nathan was David's son. He was his first son, but the kingship didn't pass to him. It passed to Solomon. So Matthew traces it differently than Luke traces it because Luke is tracing it from Mary's line. Matthew's tracing it from Joseph's line. And the reason why he's doing that is because in the Old Testament period, you would use genealogies to prove a theological point. And the theological point is this. Jesus is in the right lineage. He's in the line of kings. There's another thing that I think is significant. Again, this is just my opinion. I'm not saying you have to believe this. I just find it interesting. Also in Hebrew, when you wanted to make a point or you wanted to emphasize something, you wouldn't use adjectives the way that we use adjectives, which I've said this before if you've been around. So if I was mad at you, I would say I'm mad at you. But if I'm very mad at you, I would say I'm very mad at you. I would use an adjective to describe how mad I am at you. But Hebrews wouldn't do that. They wouldn't use an adjective. They would just repeat it. They would just say, I am mad, mad at you. Now, I know some of y'all over the holidays are now going to use my sermon in your argument with your spouse. You'd be like, I am mad, mad at you. And so you would repeat something, all right? And you would repeat it for emphasis. But you would only repeat something three times if it referred to the divine, if it referred to God. This is why anytime you, we get a peek into heaven in the scriptures and it talks about the angels worshiping Jesus or worshiping God, it always says that they sing holy, 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 because you would repeat something the third time to signify that's God. So I think the other significant thing that David is say, or Matthew is saying here about Jesus, he is from the line of kings, but he's not just 14, 14, he's 14, 14, 14. He's not just a king, but the Bible says he is the king of all kings. He's the king of kings. 
And you get that because he comes from the line, the royal line of the kings. Now, here's why this is also significant. Jesus came from that line, but you need to understand that he's the king of kings, but he came from some shady kings. He came from some, I mean, this is the genealogy of Jesus. Now, I don't want you to miss this again, and we get this just by reading the names, and a lot of times we would just kind of skip that section and move on to verse 18, and we'll get there in just a second, but I just want to highlight the fact that this is Jesus' family. This is Jesus' people through Joseph, which would have been, we might say, his stepfather, because it wasn't a biological father, but this is his family. This is his lineage. This is his genealogy. Now, I don't know if you've done any studies about your own families, but you know, for us, for Americans, a lot of times, genealogies didn't mean that much because we're most of us from other countries. But now that we can do genetics and those kind of studies, and I don't know if you've done that, you know, Ancestry, 23andMe and all that kind of stuff where you can go see where your family's from. Well, I've been researching my own family for this last year because I've heard a lot of stories and I want to make sure they're correct. And my great-grandfather on my dad's side came from Germany and actually saw where he landed at Ellis Island and got his papers and see, okay, that is true, and and how the name changed when it was from German into English. And then learning some of my other family history, because I'd always heard, this is crazy, and I've said this sometimes before, but Dolly Parton's one of my cousins. (laughs) Crazy, man. She's in my family. But I wanted to know that, so I've been doing some research and making sure that that is true and seeing that the names match up, and it is, which is crazy, and I've joked about this before, but I give my dad a hard time because my parents are cousins, for real, like my mom and dad are straight cousins, and my dad's from Arkansas, and so, (laughs) and I joke about this all the time, but people are like, wait, I think it's funny, but I give my dad a hard time, I'm like, dad, if cousins were an option, why didn't you choose Dolly? (laughs) This is long before she was famous, right, but... But she's like 10 years older. And my dad's response back to me is, well, she quit coming to family reunions, right? And so, uh, but that's true. And I've even emailed to be like, hey, I'd love to meet you. We're cousins, right? So that's my family. But there's, there's not just famous people in my family. There's all kinds of messed up people in my family. You start tracing it back. You don't have to go very long. I don't know if you've ever done a genogram, but just kind of maps out your family history and family story. There is some jacked up stuff in there. But here's what I want you to understand. Jesus comes from a messed up family too. He comes from a messed up family. I mean, just look at some of the names. Abraham, the first guy. I mean, the guy that God calls in Genesis 12 to make a great nation out of. He says, by your wife, you're gonna have a son. And and then he moves and he obeys God, but then they go into Egypt and he says his wife is beautiful. So he pawns her off as his sister to Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh takes his sister into his house. Ladies, I don't know about you, but I think that would cause some marriage problems. If your husband pawns you off as his sister and then allows you to be taken by another dude, and then God has to curse Pharaoh and say, that is not his sister, that is his wife. And then he gets her back and then they can't have kids. And so they come up with this crazy idea of like, oh, you can have a child by my man, my maidservant. And he does and births a child. That's a whacked up family. Still dealing with the consequences of that to this day. And then finally he has Isaac, and then Isaac then gets Jacob, and Jacob's name literally means deceiver. I mean, boy was coming out of the womb, grabbing his brother's heel, mad that his brother came out before him. Talk about narcissism. (laughs) He wanted to be first, even out of the womb. He wanted to have that over his brother the rest of his life. Literally, God has to wrestle with him, you know, push his hip out of socket, changes his name from Jacob to Israel. Then he's got 12 sons. And then those 12 sons, if you don't know that story, 11 of them say they sell Joseph into slavery and then lie, say he's dead. Listen, I didn't like my siblings growing up, but I wouldn't have done that. I I said, I love them. I still love them. You know what I'm saying? But like, you have arguments. I never did that. And that's just in the first three generations. You go on and and then you go to, uh, we love the story of Boaz and Rahab. You know Rahab? You know the story of Rahab? She was a prostitute. And yet she's in Jesus's lineage. And then you get to Ruth. Ruth was a Moabitess. And we love that story of Ruth and Boaz. But Ruth worshiped a different God. And yet she's in his lineage. And then you get to David. Come on, man. David, a man after God's own heart. Yeah, most of the time, but not all the time. 
Remember that story where he's sitting on his rooftop and I've been where his house would have stood and look over, I'll show you a picture one day, you can see the rooftops, I've seen them. And then he sees Bathsheba bathing and he's like, I got a good idea, I'm gonna take her as my wife. Bad idea, bro. And he does, takes her as his wife. She has a kid, the son dies, then she, he has her husband killed. So he's an adulterer and a murderer. And then he has another son, Solomon. And that's who the kingship passes to. And now, let's not even talk about Solomon, my gosh. He was the wisest man who ever lived, but apparently he wasn't so wise because he had so many wives that they turned his heart away from God. Let that be a warning to all men. I mean, again, and I'm, 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 I'm not even half, I'm just in the first 14. And you go on to these crazy kings, Rehoboam, Joseph, you see what all that they did. I mean, you would, you would be stunned to look at the shady people in Jesus's family line. Now, why am I making a big deal about this? This is why. Jesus came from that family because he came for that family. In fact, that's my point. You might want to write it down. This is who Jesus came from because this is who Jesus came for. This is who Jesus came from. This is what his family reunion, his stories would have consisted of because this is who Jesus came for. The reason why this is so important, again, it's because all of us, all of us have crazy families, crazy family genealogies, family lines, family trees, all kinds of sin in them. And so often what happens is we think that God can only save people who have clean records. God can only use people who don't have uh, you know, all that junk, all that baggage. And we think, man, there's no way God could save me. There's no way God could use me. Do you know my family? Do you know my story? And what I would say to you is, no, I don't. And, and to a degree, don't hear this as a negative. It doesn't matter because I'm pretty sure your family ain't that bad. This was the family that he came from. And the reason why that's significant is because this is the family he came for. How do I know that? Look at verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. Now, why would Matthew say that? He didn't say the birth of these other people took place in a certain way, because we know how that happened. I don't have to get into that. But the birth of Jesus took place in a different way. Look at this. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. That word there from, I love prepositions that you've been around here. That's a preposition of causation. That means the Holy Spirit caused this. Here's what I find so interesting. The word there, birth, literally in the Greek is the Greek word Genesis. That's literally how you would say it in Greek. Genesis. And to me, that's a, a kind of a tipping point or a tip-off point to, to signify that this birth is different. This child is different because he doesn't have a Genesis like the rest of us. Because he was there in Genesis. In the beginning of all things, he was. And so this son is different than any other son that has come before him. And I love how Luke describes this again, because Luke gives us Mary's account. And we all know that women are going to give a better description, which I'm so glad that Luke interviewed Mary. And, and Mary says it like this, and Luke writes it, and he gives this kind of picture that he's describing what happened in Mary's womb is just like what happened in Genesis. The Bible describes in Genesis that the Holy Spirit was hovering over the face of the deep, and then the Holy Spirit brought forth life. And Luke describes it in such a way that the Holy Spirit was hovering over the darkness of Mary's womb and brought forth life. And so that son is from or is caused by the Holy Spirit. So the birth of this son is different. This son is not just from man. He's from God. He's from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit calls this. Now, don't you know that when Mary is now pregnant by somebody that she is not betrothed to be married to, that's going to cause some problems. Like the Holy Spirit caused some problems in her life. This is where when you're like, God, I want you to use me, he may cause some things to happen that kind of derail your plans. 
Don't you know that Mary was like, uh, yeah, sure, I'm going to be pregnant? I mean, she talks about that in Luke. And, and just imagine what that conversation with Joseph was like. Hey, Joseph, uh, <laughs> I got to tell you something. I know we're about to get married and we're betrothed. And you got to understand in Hebrew culture, being betrothed was way much more than in our culture of engagement. What would happen is the, the boy, the son of one family would then go to the girl's family and then literally give them a gift to purchase, to pay for, not saying women are property, just saying they're valuable. Come on, somebody, right? And then he would go back to his family's house and start building a room onto the house and she would stay there. And during that time would be the betrothal and it was, uh, it was legal, it was binding. So much more than our engagement today so that if someone broke that off, they would have to give a certificate of divorce even before the marriage ceremony. And it would have been scandalous for Mary to say, I am pregnant. And just imagine that conversation when she's like, Joseph's like, who's the dad? The Holy Spirit. <laughs> Again, I think we can just read the things in the Bible and just kind of move right on past them and miss the significance. What was it like to be Joseph? I mean, Matthew tells us, look at verse 19. And after her husband, Joseph, being a just man, see, it's already calling him her husband, and they weren't married yet, but that's how significant it was. Being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, that's important, we already said that, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Joseph, being a just man, he had every right to humiliate Mary, and he even had the right for her to be put to death. Talk about how high of an emphasis they put on purity and marriage. And so here she is, pregnant, with the Holy Spirit, and Joseph's like, I'm out. It's crazy. My family's already crazy enough. I don't need this drama, right? That's my interpretation of what he was thinking. <laughs> and then the Holy Spirit comes to him while he's asleep and says, Joseph, son of David, this son is from the Holy Spirit. She's not lying. And this son you're going to name Jesus. Here's why that's significant. Obviously, the woman would give birth and the man would name the child. And typically, the, the child's name would be some iteration of the husband's name, the dad's name, the family's name. But Joseph is not the biological father of this child, so he doesn't have the right to name this child. God has the right to name this child, and he tells him his name will be Jesus. Now, here's why that's significant. Jesus is the Greek form of the name, Jesus, but his Hebrew form of the name would have been Yeshua or Yeshua. Again, Hebrew didn't have a J sound. It would be a Y sound. And that's significant because the first is two parts that make up that name. The first part is Yahweh, which was his covenant name, which is what he told Moses. He says, I am what I am. That's Yahweh. It's the Hebrew word to be or I am. And then Shua saves so literally, when the angel tells Joseph, his name is God saves, that's his name. His name is the Lord is salvation, and he is the one whom all the prophets pointed forward to, and he will save his people from their sins. And then he quotes the prophet. Look at this, verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Not saying that would be his actual name, but saying everybody would look at him and say that was God with us. Now, this is the significance of this. This is the son that the entire Old Testament pointed forward to. This is the king of kings that comes from the line of kings. And this king is different than all the other kings because he came to actually do what all the other kings failed to do, which was save their people. And that's significant because he's God with us. 
Now, this is crazy. The prophet that he's quoting here is Isaiah. This is this little fun tidbit that I learned while we were in Israel. And this just is amazing to me. You have to understand that in the 20th century, 19th century, 18 and 1900s, the Bible came under such intense scrutiny, intense scrutiny. And one of the things that the higher critics attacked was the virgin birth, because they felt like if they could disprove that, then everything else falls apart if he's not God in the flesh. And, and the Jewish people criticized Christians for years, hundreds, thousands of years of actually changing the text of Isaiah. Because one of the primary ways that a Gentile person, a Christian person, or a believing Jew would evangelize a Jewish person is say, listen, read your own scriptures. Read Isaiah. Isaiah is the most major prophet, the most significant prophet, because he had more messianic prophecies than any other prophet. And so to the point where Jewish people said, no, those Christians changed it. Those Christians changed the text of Isaiah. And then in the 1900s, this is crazy. Down by the Dead Sea, a little shepherd boy was there. He threw a rock into a cave. And in that cave were some pottery that contained some scrolls. And he broke one. And then they went up to go see what it was. And what it was, there was this community in the time of Christ that had preserved a lot of the Old Testament. Fragments from all the Old Testament book. But there was one book that was complete in its complete form. Any guess on which one it was? Isaiah. You guys are smart. And I, I just look at that and I think that was God's way. Sitting in a cave for over almost 2,000 years is a complete book of Isaiah. And everybody's criticizing that Christians have changed it. And God's like, watch this. Throw a rock, boy. Uh-huh, uh-huh. To the point where the Jewish people now have to concede, no, they didn't change it. Because up until that point, the oldest copies of the Old Testament we had were about 900 AD, and then the Dead Sea Scrolls took us all the way back almost 1,000 years to BC before Christ. You think that was a coincidence? No. Why? Because Jesus is who Isaiah said he was. And how do we know that Jesus is who Isaiah said he was? Is because he had a supernatural birth. He's God. And then Jacob or Joseph wakes up from the dream and look at what happens. Verse 24 and 25. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Yeshua, Jesus. Now, again, we read this story looking back into history, knowing what Jesus did. But you got to look at this from uh, Joseph's point of view. At this point in time, Jesus wasn't even born yet. Jesus hadn't saved anybody yet. Jesus hadn't gone to the cross yet. Jesus hadn't resurrected yet. He hadn't done any of that. But God comes to Joseph in a dream and says to him, this is God, the promised Messiah that Isaiah was talking about. And this is me. This is from me. This is me. Don't miss this. And when he awakes, he calls his name in faith. God saves and that's what Joseph was doing. He was putting himself and his whole family lineage into Jesus's people saying, he's going to save me. He's going to save me. And church, here's why this is significant. So many of us today are like Joseph. We're all alive, but we're asleep. We're alive, but we are dead, spiritually speaking. We're doing our thing, living our family lineage. You just come by it naturally. And listen, I do believe in the generational curses of the things that are passed down to us from our parents, from our grandparents, from all these other things that happen in our life. But here's what I want you to see. Jesus came from a family just like that too. But in Joseph, it shifted because Joseph believed in faith that Jesus was going to save him from that family history. And so from Joseph, a new lineage started because of Jesus and what Jesus would do. And that's what I'm telling you. Jesus can do the same thing in your life because you might be asleep today, but the Holy Spirit can come to you and speak to you and awaken you. And then you can respond in faith and call out the name of Jesus to save you. 
And I want you to understand something. If you're thinking today, well, there's no way he could save me, bro. You don't understand my family. Like I told you, I don't have to understand your family because I can understand his family. I don't have to understand all the things that have happened to you or with you or because of you or because of your parents or all those other types of things because all I know is this, Jesus came from the same kind of family, but he came for the same kind of family. And one of the greatest tragedies in the church today is we unintentionally send a message to the world that's saying God only saves good people. No, my friend, listen to me. God only saves sinners. That's it. That is the only requirement to be saved. Do you understand that? The only requirement to be saved is when you say, hey, my genetics ain't cutting it. Listen, I got some messed up genetics, parents, cousins. Come on now. And the only thing that's going to free me from my bondage to that is Jesus saving me from it because he came to save for his people. And so if you're here today and you think, man, there's no way that God can save me. There's no way that God can use me. There's no way that God can change the story of my family. Look at Jesus's family all from a list of names that sound like we're just reading out of the phone book. And there's another name I want, I want to mention. It's not in the list, but it's the dude who wrote the list. Matthew. Matthew is not in the lineage of Jesus like Joseph, but Matthew wrote about the lineage of Jesus. And that's significant. See, if you don't know the story of Matthew, Matthew tells us in Matthew chapter nine, which I just have to imagine is just a crazy thing for him to write. But in Matthew nine, he tells the story that he's sitting at his tax collector booth and Jesus comes up to him and says, follow me. Now you need to understand in Jewish culture, they hated the tax collectors more than anybody else because a tax collector was a Jewish person who was working on behalf of the Roman government because during that period, they were under occupation by Rome. Rome was ruling the whole world. And so the Jewish people in their own homeland were now subject to paying taxes to Rome. They hated the Romans and anybody who was Jewish, who was collecting money to send back to Rome was double hated. I mean, we don't like the IRS today. And if you work for them, I'm not saying you're a bad person, but at least we're not under occupation from a foreign government. And so they hated tax collectors, but you want to know why in Matthew chapter nine, Jesus looks at Matthew and says, hey, follow me. And I love this story, and you can read this later in Matthew chapter nine. It says that in that night, Jesus was having dinner with Matthew, his tax collector buddies, and sinners. So much that it upset the religious folk. Listen, if you ain't upsetting some religious people because you're hanging out with some sinners, you ain't doing it right. <laughs> and he says, I didn't come for the righteous because there's not any righteous. I came for the sick. And Matthew was the chief one. But don't miss this. Matthew opens up his gospel writing the genealogy of Jesus. Why did God choose Matthew? Because if there was one person in Jewish culture that had to know the genealogies of families, it was tax collectors. Why is that significant? Because if I'm a tax collector and I show up to your house, and you're like, oh, bro, I ain't got any money. I'm out. We poor. We poor. We're beggars. I would need to know your family. I'm like, you're not poor. You're just acting right now because I know you. I know your daddy, your daddy's daddy, your greasy granny. I know your family history. Pay up, sucker. So Matthew had to know all the family connections. Matthew had to know all the genealogies of the Jewish people he was collecting money for or from. And that's the dude who Jesus said, follow me. And he did. And he wrote in his gospel a genealogy that he would have known. My friends, listen to me. Not only can God save you from your wicked family, not only are you not bound by biology, you are now free in Christ to start a new lineage, a new family. Not only that, but God can use your experiences that you've had pre-Christ 
the skills that you learned, the things that you went through, he can use it for his glory. And so if you're here today and and you haven't trusted Christ, I'm trying to show you, you can come to Christ and he can save you from your sins. And all you have to do is confess that you are a sinner and that you need saving. But then there's a lot of you here that I know just because I know you, you've been following Christ, but maybe your experiences of 2019 or 2018 or the last 10 years or whatever. And you're like, I can't get past those experiences. And that's because God's saying, I want to use those. I taught you those skills. I'll let you go through those things because I want to use them now to, for my glory to tell the stories. So church, hear me. Don't ever think that God can't save somebody like you and don't ever think that God can't use somebody like you. And let me wrap it up like this. You know, Jesus, or Matthew, writes a list of names. But another apostle, John, writes the book of Revelation, and he talks about another book. And in that book will also be a list of names. And it's called the Lamb's Book of Life. And there will be names written in it that Jesus calls his sheep, his people. All the people that he came for, those are his people. Born again by his spirit. And what's crazy to me is that word there, his, in the text, it's a pronoun. Again, I love pronouns. It's a possessive pronoun. It's a genitive pronoun. What that means is genitive is the same root word as the word genealogy and the word genesis. It means to beget. See, it doesn't matter who you were born from, physically speaking. What matters, were you born again from Jesus, spiritually speaking? And if you were, if you are, your name is written in that book. But there will also be a list of other names, Jesus says, that he calls goats that aren't his people. So my question for you today is simply this. If I were to write a new genealogy, not of Jesus' physical family, but of Jesus' spiritual family, would your name be written in that book? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for not leaving us, for not abandoning us to our sins. God, I know if people are like me, I've got a past and I've got family and I've got stories And there's been so many times in my life where I've thought, it makes no sense why you saved somebody like me. Because I'm a sinner. But God, thank you that that's exactly who Jesus came for. He only came for people who knew they needed to be saved. And so God, I pray right now for the people in this room in Jasper that are listening maybe online that are asleep They haven't seen, been awoken to the reality of who Jesus is. Would you open their eyes right now, God, so that they could respond in faith and call on the name of Jesus just like Joseph did and be saved? Nobody looking around or talking here as we close, but if there has never been a point in time in your life where you have confessed your sins like Romans 9 Romans 10, 9 says, and believed in Christ, then that can happen today. And I don't want you for one second to think that there is nobody, no way God could save somebody like you. Because that's who he came from. And that's who he came for. And so if you want to trust him today and be saved and be forgiven from that past, from that sin, from that family tree, from that genealogy, and become a part of his family then you can have a new beginning. You can have a new birth. You can have a re-genesis right now. So again, nobody looking around or talking. If you want to trust Christ for the first time, you can pray with me, not out loud. And it goes like this. Say, Father, thank you so much for loving me that you sent your son in my place for my sin. 
I confess I'm a sinner. I come from a long line of sinners. But I confess Christ as my Savior. Would you forgive me for my sins? And in faith, I believe. Again, nobody looking around or talking, but if you just prayed that with me, if you just trusted Christ, the greatest day of your life, because you are now born again. So if that was you, again, nobody looking around or talking, would you just lift up your hand if you just prayed that with me so we can know and celebrate with you? Thank you. Lift them up, lift them up. Don't be ashamed, man. It's the best day. Thank you. We got men and women going to walk around, put a gift in your hand, and when they do, you can put your hand down. It's a Bible. We want you to know some next steps because you're a part of a new family now, man. You're no longer defined by your family's failures. You're defined now by Jesus' success. You got a new family, the new family of Jesus. And then those of us in the house that, if you think, probably like Matthew thought, that there's no way God could use you. There's no way he can use the experiences that you've gone through. Listen, I want to encourage you. It was not an accident that Jesus spoke to the guy who would have known the genealogy and said, follow me, because God wanted him to write the genealogy. So God can use your experiences too. And so if you've already trusted Christ and you're just wrestling with all the things that you've gone through, maybe some of by your own choices, maybe by other people's choices, listen, friend, please. God can still use you. He can redeem even what other people would have hated you for. He can redeem that for his glory and your good. Father, thank you so much. There is no story like Christmas. There is no story like the gospel. There is no good news unless you came into our human story and put on flesh and dwelt among us and died on a cross and rose again. So thank you, God. Thank you for saving people like us. And we celebrate you. And can't wait until the day that you return and we are with our new family forever. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen.